coming to our next speaker. Uh, our next speaker is Raul Sarot. Sarot, sorry, Raulcito. Uh, Raul is an Argentinian born, New Zealand based designer, strategist, and creative director. He has an experience running successful design and branding studios as being on the other side, taking an active role in corporate boardroom decisions. Raul's creative background and deep industry experience has been forged, working with a mix of international and local clients across all media channels, both commercial and non-for-profit. These days, he divides his time between leading his own boutique design studio, freshfish.co.nz, teaching design papers at AUT, and being a creative strategist consultant to several companies. Uh, I have the privilege also to work with Raul, and he's one of the most loved lecturers that I ever met. So welcome, Raul Zito. The stage is all yours, hermano. Thank you. Obrigado, Marcos. Good everyone. Um, I will set my screen. And I will introduce myself then. Uh, Tiago, would you mind letting me know if uh, we are in full screen there? Not yet. You haven't started shared yet, right? Uh, I hope I did. It's not showing? No, it's not showing yet. Okay. How about now? Yeah, it's coming up now. Yeah, full screen, perfect. This, okay. Well, um, we are going to talk about uh, global design mindsets, um, and I will introduce the topic and I will introduce myself as we go. So I know we are tied by time, run by the very pre precise Marcus today. So um, within that topic, we are going to talk about challenges and opportunities of creative nomads in local and global ecosystems, and we will uh, unpack um, what I mean by that. So firstly, kia ora, everyone, and hello, hola, and hola. Um, ko andes te monga, ko parana te awa, ko sarot toku iwi, ko saviski toku hapu, ko waihi ki toku marae no Argentina ho, ko Raul Rajau, ko Mercedes o ku matua, ko Raul sarot toku ingoa. Thank you, everyone, and thank you, Marcos and AUT and everyone involved. I understand the, the huge enterprise that this is, and uh, Link as a beautiful forum for exchanging and sharing uh, exploration, ideas, uh, aims, and research. Um, so it's really an honor uh, to be part of this. Uh, I think it's my second time or third time, I can't remember, as a Link speaker in this fifth edition. That's amazing, and I have enjoyed um, listening to you all and learning from you all. So thank you so very much for your mahi, uh, all the presenters, really different and really rich um, presentations. So thank you. Uh, a bit about myself. Uh, I'm a designer. Uh, I work as a design coach. I have been working as an eye director and a creative director in previous incarnations of my life. Um, I'm a lecturer, as I said, always, uh, that's uh, one of my passions, and that's what I do with all my heart. Um, I'm a keynote speaker in innovation, in design, life-centered design, in design thinking, etc. and I work, help companies and enterprises, for-profit or non-for-profit, um, to reach their desired audiences um, in a, using design as a vessel. But um, without further ado, today, today Correro is around those uh, many, many things and, and really is uh, partly sharing uh, my thoughts and my reflections on my work that I have been doing over 30 years in different countries and different design fields, um, but also um, 
yeah, it's hearing from you. And uh, sometimes you, uh, some of the uh, thoughts may be a provocation for further correros and further conversations. So um, let's talk about uh, a bit of the title of the presentation, the global design mindsets. Uh, and let's unpack what that is, what global is. And uh, most of you might be familiar, of course, uh, it's that aspect of global, but also local. So it's the macro and it's the micro together. Uh, and it's something that we as, uh, as creatives, as designers, as artists, uh, some of you, um, we face in everything we do every day. And, and mostly some of us uh, being in a different country and as part of this diaspora that is also... Um, the Correro that the, the conference, the lead conference is uh, talking about the Latin American diaspora and particularly here in Aotearoa, New Zealand. Uh, but I will also would like to um, expand that, um, that focus in Aotearoa in the South Pacific, where I had the pleasure to do uh, a lot of work over the years uh, in different industries as well. So we as creative nomads, uh, this is me uh, working in the Solomon Islands in a very remote part. That is the, although uh, could be Waihiki where I live, Waihiki Island actually is not. That's a Kolombangara uh, island across from Noro in the Western provinces, a very remote part of, of uh, near PNG, Papua New Guinea. Um, so part of the, the, what we are talking about as creative nomads is this aspect of reinsertion uh, uh, into a, a new context, into new ecosystems, into new realities. And we as designers, particularly, um, that is a very beautiful challenge for us, uh, this reinsertion. And of course, that reinsertion talks about insertion. And, and when we are inserted, could be self-inserted, into a, a new world. And uh, this is not a, an Eurocentric uh, vision of the new world of discovery, but it's a new world for us. And, and that new world, I will also like to resignify the way uh, the world, the word world, goodness, um, because what is a world it could be our environment, our immediate environment is our world and is what defines us. But also, I would like to uh, take, uh, again, that beautiful provocation or thoughts or intention of the conference being the global south, because there's so many commonalities into um, South America or even Latin America and, and the South Pacific, uh, much more than sometimes what we uh, are exposed to. And, and I had the experience of... Um, or, or, or the lack of experience that firsthand in the working in the different islands on the Pacific, where I had um, the honor to be working like Samoa and Fiji and the Solomon Islands and, and remotely with, with other with our islands and nations of the Pacific, apart from, of course, Aotearoa, New Zealand, where I am based. So in that <laughs> reinsertion, I think the beautiful thing is what do we bring what do we bring to that new world what do we bring with us what is innate with us what is innate in us and and of course uh, as creatives we have a special set of um, sensi sensibilities and sensitivities that we bring with us there's a natural curiosity there's a natural empathy there's a natural optimism that uh, is so innate in all of us and what we do. Otherwise, we couldn't be doing what we do. Uh, but also what part of what we bring is what we have learned. Part of what we bring is what is acquired. And, and all of that uh, represents a, a whole set of challenges, of course, uh, for us. Uh, some of us, as some of you um, mentioned before in your own presentations, the language and, and that is even if you can command in this case uh, English as, as a second or third language or fourth language it, it also the mastering and I think was uh, this word was used by some of you um, the mastering of the language for us as communicators or as designers or, or as artists is so important 
because the value of the word and the value of the concept and the value of the corero is so important to what we say because we are constantly creating meaning through our work. But also those challenges always, all the time, as designers, we know that they represent opportunities. Uh, there's a natural uh, association uh, when we uh, move and when we migrate and in that diaspora, it's an association that we associate by what we know and what we understand, but also it's a disassociation sometimes in the sense that we have to embrace like um, new ways of living and uh, new environments and new traditions and new customs without, uh, of course, forgetting, but quite the opposite, honoring ours. Uh, so that interesting tension between the associations and disassociation is something that uh, lives in our work that we do and what we bring. And I, I love this concept, a uh, specific concept, Mahina, Moana theory of a tava and time and space, because in that disassociation, uh, there is that challenging of a changing of time and a changing of space of working in new realities. Um, but to do a bit of backcasting uh, to start the presentation, um, I will talk about something that some of you already talked about before, and that's uh, the the beauty and the risk of being the lucky last in the in this set of uh, you know speakers that uh, introduce the the whole Corero before me, and is the Kumara. Of course, uh, some of you already uh, acknowledge uh, this, and I was um, part of. Uh, of an event and uh, a Maori uh, colleague, another artist, um, actually acknowledge uh, that we as South Americans uh, gave the Kumara as a gift, as, uh, as a beautiful gift to Maori. And, and for us, of course, some for us might be the batata or batata, right? Uh, that is so familiar to us. And when I came to New Zealand for the first time, uh, some 25 years ago, uh, was uh, a sh shock and a beautiful surprise to hear that it was so embedded in Maori uh, as part of their, uh, you know, kai and part of their culture, and that they do acknowledge Maori, uh, that uh, it has been, um, you know, brought from South America, and there's a connection. So that's a uh, the Kumara is already part of the diaspora, you know, the little diaspora already um, in, in several hundred years ago, we don't even know when, as part of that Pacific migration, uh, Kumara arrived in New Zealand. But um, what we do know is that there's already a connection and that Kumara is a vessel already of uh, integration of um, cultures. And, but what I'm... The aspect of Kumara or Kuma, as it was beautifully um, mentioned before, what is that connection? And and what I'm intrigued and um, somehow triggered in my uh, thinking is around what were the what was the mindset then? What was the mindset for Maori to bring the Kumara here? What what were their needs? Uh, and uh, that idea of that idea of adapting, adapting a crop or adapting in this case a root and adapting it to their diet and adapting and, and bringing that. And there was an aspect of creativity in it and, and an aspect of innovation and uh, ad uh, an aspect of diversity and an, as an aspect of opportunity into bringing uh, Kumara to New Zealand. But there's not only the Kumara that we share in common. Uh, I was also by being immersed in Aotearoa, New Zealand, and learning perhaps um, a more colonial aspect that we also share, um, the, which is the, the wire. And here in New Zealand, um, the number eight wire, you know, it's like we can sort it. It's a number, way, number eight wire mentality. Um, so in, in uh, back in Argentina, where I originally come from, is also the alambre, you know, the atamos con alambre. We put it together with wire, we hold it with wire, and that's a way to, to um, work with the limitations of what we have and and buying time sometimes or, or sorting a solution as a way of innovation. 
So there's more, there's several parallels of different aspects of parallels in between Latin America and the South Pacific and Aotearoa New Zealand. Um, as Bruce Mao says on his 24 principles of design for transforming the world, it's not about the world of design, it's about the design of the world. So uh, I will move on quickly because I have lots of slides to share with you and thoughts. Uh, but how might we, this is how we design thinkers uh, trigger and how designers in general, how might we do this? Uh, so how might we apply an empathy-based design lens to the challenges we face as creative nomads in, in new environments? How might we see the world as an ecosystem? And even if the world, the world as a, physically or geographically is more than an ecosystem, it's a sum of ecosystems and biomes. Um, I would like to again reframe that at the end of the day, it could be the world around us, each one of us, and in, in, with each one of our groups or communities. So, um, I normally use, with permission from the Hundewasser Foundation, uh, and here is um, Friedrich uh, Hundewasser on the right-hand side, um, whom here in New Zealand, uh, it's, uh, it's very um, much loved because he was established here for a while as, as he was an artist, an, arch an architect, an, an art philosopher. And he also uh, donated to New Zealand his version of what he believes is the Koru flag. Um, but also this already speaks about the integration of uh, a global creative uh, into a local environment as his interpretation of it and his um, connection with the environment. But one of the, the, the philosophies or uh, benchmarks that I use for my work to understand empathy and to understand connection with an environment when we are designing and mostly when we are designing or creating in a new environment is uh, Hundewasser's five skins theory that he wrote in the late 60s, early 70s. Uh, and it's around that we have five skins. And of course, the first skin is our dermis or epidermis. And the second skin is what surrounds us in our immediate environment, could be how we address or what defines us. And the third one could be our fare or our house uh, and how that defines us. And the fourth one will be a bit wider and perhaps the identity and the connection with others and the family and the home country. And, and even the fifth skin will be what defines us as our ecology and the outside world. But here, what I'd like to add as a challenge and a provocation is that could be us in our home country. But how does that work when we adapt into a new environment and we find people and we find ourselves with another set of perhaps skin tones and another language and another way of dressing and another, we live in a different way with different customs and our family behaves so speaks differently. And we have our own story around our own home country. So how that relationship works, and more so in a, such a multicultural uh, environment, as it is particularly Auckland, but also New Zealand, uh, how does that work? We'll bring in all those new worlds and new realities uh, and new five skins into the one wider skin, which is the social fabric uh, of New Zealand, particularly these days. Uh, so that, of course, again, brings a whole set of challenges and a whole set of opportunities. But what I'm interested here is in those connections and that empathy-based connection that we as creatives that sensibility and sensitivity that we should have. And I will share very quickly, I know we're running out of time, Marcus, but uh, I will share very quickly uh, my experience working in that very remote um, Western province, uh, a place called Noro in the very, very close to Papua New Guinea, uh, where I had the pleasure over the last five or six years to be there around five or six times working with community in different aspects uh, some in a commercial based uh, working on a strategy and branding process project, but also on a community uh, project around telling the story that the source of provenance uh, and their community work, integrating people from the different provinces and different languages and different cultures within their own nation. And um, so it is that relatability that 
which it, it embeds uh, this beautiful world of ability to relate. And of course, once you're in the community, you will see scenes that we as South Americans uh, or anywhere in the world could relate to. Um, you know, in this case, we are kids and kids having fun uh, and you are immersed in it. And for us, South Americans and being, of course, uh, football countries, we can really relate um, to their way of uh, entertaining themselves and having fun. As you can see in this photo, I was like invisible. There were so much in the game that I, I was one of them and I wasn't playing, right? I was just taking photos of the community. But um, it's that understanding. And in that understanding, uh, in this case, it's interesting because I was running a design thinking workshop in a far remote, remote port or far remote island in the far remote Pacific. Uh, it's still that idea that, that we have common needs uh, as human beings and we have common desires. And despite the different languages that we might speak, we have a common language because we share a sense of place and the sense of connection, a human connection and connection with nature. And that also open, despite uh, languages and despite uh, different cultures, a sense of belonging to the world and as humans in connection to the world that also as, uh, speaks about a sense of identity. And that sense of identity also embeds a beautiful word of entity of who we are and our exploration as human to human connections. Um, as part of their work, and, and this was a photo I took in a kindergarten, uh, is that according to what Viktor Frankl, how he defines it is that um, in his logotherapy log study, the freedom to will that will lead to the will to find meaning in life. And that connection, of course, I was taking a photo and the kid was taking a photo with his eyes of myself. Um, it's that idea of finding meaning of what we do. And to um, bring another lens to it, um, which is perhaps this neuro-linguistic programming, a completely different school of thought, it's this pyramid uh, with different layers, starting with an environment and that defines a set of behaviors and a set of capabilities and beliefs and identity. And on the top, our spiritual being and our higher higher belief even if some of these things changes when we migrate the environment might change the behaviors might be the same or the behaviors might change but the capabilities might be the same or the capabilities might be different and the beliefs might be the same or the beliefs might be different but the, our identity might be the same and so on but when we get to a real core as humans living in this planet we have a lots of commonalities so much showed this is an example. This is an English designer, David Trubridge, uh, that actually uh, he designs nature-inspired beautiful objects. Um, and as you can see, and you possibly might have seen, it's not only chairs or, or beautiful furniture, but also this beautiful installation of such a critical part of New Zealand as Rotorua. Uh, and this case is a tree walk. And he created this almost biomimicry of bringing uh, design into nature and being inspired by other nature shapes uh, that also has an aspect of global, that global view into the into the local environment. And also say architects, I mean, this is a quintessential thing in, in Kiwi culture, particularly, uh, which is the badge, right? The weekend house or a place to rest or, or a place to hang out on the weekends and share the bachelor pad, the batch. And, and this is a South African designer uh, or comp South African company based in New Zealand for a long, long time. And they are the exemplar of designing Kiwi batches of, with the New Zealand style of architecture, but they're South Africans, which is quite a different, but also similar environment. So it's that sense of connecting with the world, understanding the world around us and design the world globally. As... Um, Otto Leicher would define it back in his book, uh, the, the, the world as design as it is in English, but I love the translation in Spanish, which is the world as a project. So it's not about the world of design, but the design of the world. So thank you very much. That is my little uh, token and correro uh, to add to your beautiful correro of link. Thank you, Marcos. Obrigado. Gracias, everyone. And it's always a pleasure to be part of this. 
Thank you, Raul. Thank you so much. Please, guys, can you pop in your questions for Raul in our chat? Uh, Raul, how do you see? Oh, you you talk about this internationalization of you know how people migrate different places. They can take their things. They integrate nature to their new places and all this. It's quite complex thinking. How do you see? how technology is affecting this today because you you see you we saw in your photographs a lot of uh can he take it can he presence there being there walking there making physical workshops meeting people exchange these experience how do you see uh after covid this change with you know meetings online and technology and things have to be speed up, we have to follow our times. Does it make sense the question? Yes. That's a very long question, Marcus. Oh, sorry. But uh, to simplify it, I think your question is how technology is affecting this. Uh, man and technology has always been hand in hand. Uh, you know, from when we were writing things on, on cave walls, we were painting with what with what we could do make do uh these days uh, i we all have uh, a critical uh, and sometimes um contradicting connection with technology we love technology would don't we i mean this conference is only happening because of technology so technology has a beautiful side to it and always had technology also has a dangerous side to it I mean, Maori brought Kumara to New Zealand because of the technology of their wakas. Otherwise, they wouldn't have been able to. Um, so the technology is always part. I think it's a we have a conflicting as a, as the world progresses and as technology progresses, as an innovation progresses, we have a conflicting ethical relationship with technology, which is a challenge for all of us. I think it's how we manage technology is the the challenge. I don't have an answer for that. I have a. I, I see. There's a question from Anelor. Thank you for your correo. A beautiful topic. I love it. The quick question: How was it for you to engage with the local communities and being accepted regarding being able to collect material for your work? Um, I think it's a. That's an empathy-based. Uh, great um, question, Anelor. It's an empathy-based. Of course, there are, there are ethical aspects, and and you need to ask for permission. But there's a natural connection between human beings. Um, for instance, one of the latest projects I did this year was photographing, actually. Um, I don't consider myself a photographer, Marcus, uh, as you know, but uh, I, it's one of my passions and my hobbies since I was like 10 years old with my first Kodak Fiesta. Um, but um, photographing people is something that I never did Um you know, for a project, but the the challenge was to be in situ and to photograph people uh, from very humble beginnings in a factory, for instance, uh, from different cultures. So that even if I was in one place, people, a thousand people were there, they were speaking different languages and from different cultures within the Solomon Islands. It's interesting because the first day I went with a beautiful camera with a, with a lens. And as soon as I did this, people freaked out. Um, however, uh, then uh, I had my phone with me and uh, I'm an iPhone photographer because that's what I, I, I use every day on my walks. And people are so used back to technology, Marcos. I think this links beautifully. They are so used to technology these days that an iPhone or, or a phone wasn't scare, scary for them. Uh, so, and I, I wasn't uh, shooting... Um, kind of hiding the phone all, all quite the opposite in some cases it all started with a selfie with them and and that broke the barriers it's interesting so that th even within photography the aspects of technology that are polarizing or scary and as aspect of technology that you find the commonality and the connection that's on one side uh, the other side is we forget that what breaks the barriers to uh with with any other human being is uh, a genuine smile and a genuine connection and a, and and that relatability that I was talking about in my slides 
So if I grew up, for instance, seeing kids play bare feet football in a grass field, I will very naturally be there as one of them. If I wouldn't have, possibly I would have been really an alien. Yeah. Uh, if I grew up uh, collecting water from the roof, now I live on Waikiki and that's an everyday thing for me because I, I drink the water I collect from my roof. So where we come from, and, and that's what I mean, what we bring as innate things or things we learned in our aspect really brings empathy-based doors to connecting with different audiences. That's a long answer. And Laura, I don't know if that makes sense. That was lovely. Thank you. Thank you so much. It was a lovely presentation. Yeah, Yara, thank, thank you. Yara Ro, thank you so much. I was always really impressed by your thinking. And that's why we asked you to close link. You're very pleased to have your thinking shared with us. Thank you so much, Ro. That's yes, it. Thank okay. you, Robert, for posting this. Uh, much appreciate your manner, uh, you know, leading all of this and, and, and receiving us in your land. That's right. So before I pass the word for Amatua to conclude our work in here, I just want to uh, make a couple of acknowledgements here before we close. So as we bring the fifth edition of Link to a close, I would like to extend my gratitude for some people that was very important for this conference. And firstly, a huge thank you for all our speakers. Your dedication to share your research and insights have been invaluable. Professor Welby Inks once said to me, the true scholar is marked by one thing, and this thing is generosity. I think your contributions have truly embodied it. Uh, Professor Wings talk about generosity. So thank you all. I know we are in such a busy times here for all we work in education. We are over and over uh, at, at, to make time to prepare this presentation for this very busy time is a huge thing. I know I acknowledge that and I want to thank you all from the deep of our heart for your contribution here. We would like to make a special appreciation to the whole organizing team from Galo, Agencia Galo in Brazil. And I would like to thank you, Thiago, Thales, Laís, Marianne, and all the Galo team that works behind the scenes. Our great translators, Natalia and Cristiano, for making very smooth the understanding in between these two universe and these two languages, making a true universal understanding of what we are exchanging here. Thank you very much. Thank you for Link's producer, Janete Rodrigues, and our research assistant, Chenying Li, and our, our acknowledgement for our loved Gary Tathan, which he always supports us with contability issues and everything. I would love for you, Gary. We are also thank you for our great partner, Education New Zealand, in the figure of Bruna Natali. And at the time that you were also planning Link, our dearest Ana Azevedo, thank you, Education New Zealand, for your support, for always being with us in this journey of link. Uh, it's important to acknowledge something I was thinking here, and I didn't talk about that. So living in diaspora, like we all, the speakers, do live in diaspora. Don't worry, Herbert, you are coming. Uh, it's something very challenging. It's difficult to be away from home, and I think in some way, many of us that have families overseas, families in Latin America, we miss them very dearly every day. So I would like to send our love and an uh, in, in, in acknowledgement for all the speakers' family back in Latin America overseas. Uh, from all of us presenting here, I want to say that uh, having you guys somewhere in Chile, Argentina, Brazil, Colombia is what feeds us. So receive all our love from Aotearoa for your sons living here away from the family. And it wouldn't be different with my own family. And I will still a little bit the same to thank you, my family, for the support on these years of the event. Mama Ilza, 
é, Jaqueline, Iracema, Fred, Paulo, Cícero, Deusa, Renata e Estela. É, of course, my gorgeous wife, Janete Rodrigues also. You, your love and support, it's what makes us this very special. A very a quick story. This morning, my mom sent a very, very small message on the phone. Look, I'm watching the presentations. Please do not eat sandwiches in front of the camera. And I said, okay. <laughs> so, a long promise, my mind. Finally, my deepest thank you for my colleagues who have been working with me, Link, for many years. Professor Sergio Nesteriuk, that we have been working together, I think, on the last 20, 20 some years. Thank you for your partnership and friendship, Sergio, and for our deep conversations over Gara's time. Because for some reason, Sergio is a man who never sleeps and he walks with his dog in the middle of the night. So usually he talks to me at one o'clock in the morning, two o'clock in the morning when he goes to walk with his dog, which is something quite interesting. Uh, so thank you, Sergio. And of course, I want to give a very special and warm acknowledgement for my Kaumatu, a mentor friend, Dr. Robert Pulfori. Uh, your mentorship and guide on these uh, years of New Zealand, making such an easy and smooth understanding of this different world that we navigate, supporting Link, being here every day, and having the flag of Brazil behind you. It's just so special for us. Our biggest love, Robert. Your charm make Link a very different uh, venue. I'm looking forward for Link next year. We have great plans to take Link to South America to make an edition in South America. We want to bring Robert and everybody down uh, to South America and hopefully be closer to our families on the next year. So I hope to count on all of you on the next year. Uh, muito obrigado a todos. Gracias. Tena culto, tena culto, tena tatu, katua. Robert, the word is yours. We can't hear Rob. You are in mood. I was coughing. <clears throat> um, um, just before I close with our closing prayer, I just want to reiterate um, uh, Mahakos's um, observations of the quality and the rigor of your presentations. They were absolutely wonderful, dynamic, powerful, and provocative, thought-provoking. Congratulations, they were absolutely amazing. We have a whakatauki, uh, a proverb, which goes, ko te pae tawhiti, whāia. Kia tata ko te pae tata, whakamaua kia tina. And it essentially means, seek out the far distant horizons and cherish those knowledges that you have attained. And what you have done is that you've taken us to new worlds, to new ideas, to new knowledges. And we thank you very much. We are now seeking the far distant horizon and you're bringing that knowledge and bringing the world to us in Aotearoa, New Zealand. And for that, we thank you. <clears throat> uh, our prayer is going to reiterate the opening prayers from yesterday, and that is to invoke our gods uh, to conspire to end all hostilities and wars around the world and to stop the killing of innocent babies, children, women, men uh, in these hostilities and these wars. So, I hope that these wars do not come to our parts of the world and that you remain safe and look after each other. We have also a word, a concept, mate mate aone, and that is to love each other and to, and to look after each other and to nurture each other. So on that, we'll have our karakia. <clears throat> kia whakairia te mauri kirunga, kia whakairia te tapu kirunga, kia wā te ara, Ke māku hakoha te wairua, tūruki whakataha, tūruki whakataha, mauri tū, mauri tau, mauri ora kia tātou katoa, whānau, whānau, haramai te toki haumi e, hui e, tāi ki e. And Marcos, mum, we love you, 
and uh, you have to keep um, keep us on track. Love everybody uh, in South America, Latin America.